let's open our service in order of prayer time. Father, we are thankful that this world is not our home, that we're just a passing through. We're so thankful that you have reserved for us a home in heaven for everyone who's put their faith and trust in you as their personal Savior. Uh, Father God, will we be encouraged um, to know that that is something that is secure through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's given to us eternal life. Uh, Father, we're also thankful for the many blessings that you send our way. Uh, help us not to focus on the negative. Help us not to focus on the things that we're lacking in our life for the difficulties or the challenges, but may our focus be on you. And uh, Father, as um, we take a look at uh, one specific thing that you are unable to do, I pray um, that our hearts would be challenged uh, tonight in this service. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we did receive uh, just um, on July 27th an updated newsletter from the Struther family. They're missionaries to the United Kingdom uh, from Open Door Baptist Church. And their newsletter reads this, Dear Supporting Churches and Praying Friends, uh, Greetings in the name of Christ from Greater London. We thank you for your faithful prayers and support for us in the ministry here these last few months. Life has finally begun to return normal here in the United Kingdom. For years, we have hosted a monthly church prayer meeting in our home, but COVID has stopped that. For the last 17 months, we've held prayer meetings by way of Zoom, but were unable to resume in-person prayer meetings until the first week of July. It was a blessing and sweet time to gather together and call upon the name of the Lord. There was rejoicing, praise, and even some tears. We are so grateful to be able to gather together again. All governmental COVID restrictions in the United Kingdom expired on July 19th. This past Sunday, July 25th, Community Baptist Church was able to lift its collective voices and songs of praise to our Lord for the first time since March 22nd, 2020. Again, it was a wonderful blessing to those in attendance, something that we have dearly missed in our services. Also, for the first time in months, we were not required to wear masks. We were able to have our children's classes and had fellowship together following the service. It was very encouraging to return to normality in the church. Our weekly outreaches continue to have place in our local community. We are very thankful for the freedom to be able to go out. Before COVID, it had gotten to a point where there were a number of businesses and charity groups, including some churches out on the Sutton High Street on Saturday mornings. Now I rarely see any other churches out. We are praying that the Lord would give fruit from the hundreds of tracts and the many conversations that take place week to week. Finally, we would like to leave you with a few prayer requests. We have one family we are still waiting to return to church after the most recent lockdown. Pray that the Lord might provide a permanent and more prominent location for the church. Pray for visitors and also for salvations of the community and pray for people to be obedient and follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And uh, that's our update letter from the Struthers. So I would encourage you to continue uh, to pray for them and take note of those requests that they just asked. Uh, we'll continue with our last song uh, for our service tonight, and that is He Leadeth Me. He leadeth me, oh blessed but words with them he comforts what am I doing he still is God's hand he needed me he made me with me I guess he needed me Sometimes with seeds of deepness, some things were and bow to use there still are trouble it's still tears he is there with me he is old he 
and in his faith. It be for by it is is on at last. Lord I but bless the thine head and in my nor Glory content what for dies since tis my God that me eateth me great is all in his grave would be or my son. Well, they say the, the third time <laughs> is it. And uh, so I think I finally got the chorus right on that third time. Uh, tonight, I would encourage you to take your Bibles with me and turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, we're going to look at tonight at least one thought of something that God cannot do. Uh, now, as uh, you think about title that message, What God Cannot Do, that seems to go almost against what we think as believers. Uh, we think about, um, you know, the, the truth that our God can do anything. Uh, even the little kids' song, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing that my God cannot do. Uh, but from the scriptures tonight, in Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to uh, take a look at something that the Bible says that God cannot do. And I believe that you will find great comfort and encouragement uh, in your life in this thing that God cannot do. Uh, I came across this illustration from several years ago. Uh, there was a weatherman for a New York TV station and uh, a syndicated independent network news. And he, was, uh, he had a weather, a public storm of his own making in 1979. Uh, he had studied math and physics and geology at three colleges, and he left school without a degree, but with a strong desire to be a media weatherman. Uh, he phoned the TV station, introducing himself as a PhD in geophysics from Columbia University. The phony degree got him in the door. After a two-month tryout, he was hired as an off-camera forecaster for the station. For the next decade, his career flourished. Uh, he became widely known as Dr. Bob. He was hired on by the New York Times as a consulting meteorologist. The same year, both the Long Island Railroad and the baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn hired him. Forty years of age and living his childhood dream, he found himself in public disgrace and national humil humiliation when an anonymous letter prompted the TV management to investigate his, accredited, his academic credentials. Both the station and the New York Times fired him. His story got attention across the land. He was on the Today Show, the Tomorrow Show, the In People Weekly, among others. He thought he'd lose his home and never work in media again. Several days later, the Long Island Railroad and Bowie Coon announced they would not fire him. Then the TV station gave him a job. He admits it was a dreadful mistake on his part and doubtless played a role in his divorce. I took a shortcut out to be the long way around, and one day the bill came due. I am I, I will be sorry as long as I am alive. As reported in USA Today, Jared Jellison said this, uh, it, for the average person, it is common for them to fib or to lie at least 50 times a day. He goes on to explain that we lie about our age, our income, our accomplishments. Uh, we lie to escape embarrassment. A common reason for the white lies we're told is to protect someone else's feelings. Yet in so doing, we really are protecting ourselves. According to Jellison, there, here are some of the most commonly used lies. I wasn't feeling well. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. The check is in the mail. I was just kidding. I was only trying to help. You know, this uh, individual who lied about his academic degree and uh, got a job, and later on, uh, the truth came home, and uh, he was called out upon it in disgrace and humiliation. Um, you know, that that uh, story really does prove a powerful point in each of our lives, and that is 
that daily we are challenged with whether or not to tell the truth or to tell a lie. And sadly, many times, even we as Christians, Christians, now we understand that Satan is the father of lies, but many times we as Christians who know Christ as our Savior, who have God as our Heavenly Father, who have the Holy Spirit of God residing within us, uh, that many times we find ourselves falling short in the area of not bearing false witness. Is there anyone who does not lie? Well, that is the truth that I want to share with you tonight, and that is that God cannot lie. God cannot lie, and that has some powerful truths uh, that influence or that impact each of us in our lives. Uh, If you look at Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13, here we have a passage that talks about God and his communication and uh, the truth of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Many times we find ourselves to give credibility to our word. Uh, you have heard someone say, I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear on the Bible, trying to give credibility to what we're saying. And yet God could swear by no other greater than by himself. Verse 14, saying, surely blessed I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise, speaking of Abraham. For men barely swear by the greater, and an oath for the confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherefore, God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation or comfort who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have of an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You know, it's a wonderful, comforting truth for your heart and my heart, and that is a truth that God cannot lie. He is truth. Lying is not a part of his nature. If it was, it would go against his character and he would cease to be God. Why is it so important that God does not lie? There are some great implications because God is a truth and he does not lie. This is something that God cannot do, and that is lying. And so three great implications for us as believers tonight. First of all, for the believers, we can hold on to the promises of God because he does not lie. Now, all of us have had people that have given a promise to us and they didn't come through on it. I can still remember as a a second grader, and I guess I would have been right around the age of seven or eight, uh, playing City League soccer. And I can remember playing on this this City League soccer team. There was also one other guy, his name was Nathan, and and uh, he was uh, he went to our church, and so I knew Nathan from church, and we played. And, and I was horrendous at soccer. Um, I don't think I ever got good at soccer, but but just running all over the place. And we didn't win a single game of uh, the whole season. I can remember before the last game of the season, the coach says, "You know, whether or not we win or not, I just want you to go out and do your best. And if so, then I'll take the whole team out for ice cream sundays." And I can remember that promise, even, you know, I, I guess that would be 40 years later. I remember that promise. And I remember as a team, we worked so hard. We didn't win the game, but we played much better than we had the rest of the season. And I can remember after the game, the coach saying, I'll let you know and I'll take you out for, for ice cream. And I can remember every week asking Nathan, hey, Nathan, has coach got a hold of you yet? You know, he made a promise, but he never fulfilled that promise. And as a little seven-year-old boy, that hurt. Adults are supposed to tell the truth. Parents are supposed to tell the truth. Sunday school teachers are supposed to tell the truth. Pastors are supposed to tell the truth. Missionaries are supposed to tell the truth. And we get this idea, the president of the United States is to tell the truth. The police officer is to tell the truth. And, and, and I can remember as a young child holding on to the promise and believing that they would be truthful to their word. And I remember my heart being disappointed. Well, for you and I as believers, the implication of the truth that God does not lie is that we can hold on to his promises. 
Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. But as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and yea, nay, but in him was yea. For the, all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, and the glory of God by us. Now he which stabbeth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. And so it's a wonderful thing to know that even the Apostle Paul uh, could share the authority of God's word because of the truthfulness of it. And that he did not have to um, uh, swear by anything greater because of the truth that God is true and that he does not lie. You know, the fact is, is that while others may have promised us something, prom- made a promise to us and they did not fulfill it, God All of his promises he fulfills. Now, some of them are in a different timetable than ours, and we don't see them immediately. But I'm so thankful for the promise of salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just not a select few, as some like to think, that Christ only died for those who would accept him as their Savior. No, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's promises are a sure thing. God promised Abraham that he would have a son. They had many descendants. Now, Abraham believed that promise, but there were times when he took his eyes off because of circumstances, because of age, uh, trying to work this promise through in his, in his own strength. And many times you and I in our lives, God gives us a promise and, and we're laying hold to it, but then we get impatient. We try to work it out ourselves. But yet God finally did fulfill the promise to Abraham and to Sarah, and they had a son, Isaac. And just as he promised that their descendants would be like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore, uh, so we see that through the nation of Israel, even today and throughout uh, human history. So God's promises are a sure thing. He promised Abraham he'd have a son and many descendants, and that promise came true. He promised the Israelites would have a special land. And I'm certain that while they were in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years, they questioned that promise. But yet God fulfilled that promise. And he rose up and delivered in Moses and led them out of bondage and to the promised land. God promised Noah that there would be a flood and Noah believed that. And he built the ark and the animals were sent and they were saved. And after the flood, God put a bow in the sky and he promised that he would never destroy the earth again with a flood. God's promises are a sure thing. God promised that he would send his son all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He promised that there would be a deliverer come. And I'm so thankful as it says in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made under a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those that are under the law. And what a wonderful blessing to know that Christ came just as God had promised. And the nation of Israel had looked for countless of years at the coming Messiah, and he finally came. And to know that for those of us who believe on Jesus Christ, we should not perish, as it says in John 3, 16, but that we will have everlasting life. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God the promises of God for your eternal security, that when you place your faith and trust in Christ as your personal Savior, you are born again. You receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And that is a wonderful promise to lay hold of. The promises of God are sure because he cannot and he will not lie. The promise of salvation. How about the promise of of answered prayer, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The New Testament, Christ says, ye have not because ye ask not, or you're because you're asking to consume upon your own lust and your own desires. How's your prayer life? You know, the fact is, is that we can daily approach the Lord, uh, go to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in our time of need, believing in the promise that God has said that he will hear 
that he will answer our prayer as we pray according to the Father's will. And so we can continue to pray in faith, believing that he'll hear and that he'll answer our prayers. The fact is, is that Christ promised that he would come back. John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. You know, that is a promise that Christ gave to us that we can believe on. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to know that the next time, uh, the next event on God's prophetic timetable is the rapture of the, of the church, the rapture of those who have believed upon Christ as their personal Savior. And that is a wonderful promise that we can lay hold of, that we can believe the promise that whosoever call, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The promise that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. And there's nothing that can separate you from him. The promise that we call, if we call unto him, that he will answer us and show us great and mighty things, which we know not. The promise that he is coming back again and that he's left his Holy Spirit within us, that he might help us, that he might show us the truth, that he might guide us in truth. You know, the promise that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Uh, the promise that Christ desires to live his life in and through our lives. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, to know that I don't have to live the Christian life by myself, but Christ um, wants to live his life um, through us, through the Holy Spirit of God, the promises of God are something that we can lay hold of because God does not lie. He tells us truth. Secondly, in our lives, not only can we trust and hold on to God's promises, but secondly, we can trust God's motives. We can trust God's motives. I think that probably all of us would believe with the fact that any relationship, one of the foundational elements or one of the foundational things that a relationship is built on is upon trust. If you're going to have a good marriage between a husband and wife, there has to be trust. Each spouse must be able to trust the other. If there's going to be a good friendship, there has to be great trust. I think of the, the friendship of Jonathan and David. And how many times uh, both of them encouraged each other in the Lord. And Jonathan over and over again encouraged David discouraging heart. And it was because he had to have, David had to have trust. And he certainly did have trust in his friend Jonathan. Uh, if you're going to enter into a partnership with someone else, you have to have trust that there will be good communication, that there will be honesty. Uh, that there will be um, integrity in the business decisions. Uh, a, church, a good church with its members and serving in the local church, uh, there needs to be trust as well. And so it is in our relationship with God, if we've put our faith and trust in Christ as our Savior, um, we need to trust that God's motives are always best for our lives. And we trust Him with our lives. We trust him with what's going on in our life. We trust him with the things that we don't, that, that are uncertain in our life. We trust him with the things that we know about that we don't understand about why God has allowed this to happen into our lives. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We can of certainty believe that God, as it says in Romans 8, 28, will take all things and work them together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Uh, God can even take um, that sin that was done against you and, and not to minimize that sin. And it may be um, some terrible, even wicked abuse, but God can take even that sin against you and he can work it together for good. Uh, Joseph, so many bad things happened in his life and all he did was do right, trust God and honor God. And later on, he saw the big picture. And he said to his brothers, while well, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good to save our family, to bring all of this to pass. And so in your life and my life, we can come to the promises of God's word and we can hold on to them 
but we can also trust that God's motives are always best. Uh, he, he has a desire, first of all, for everyone to be saved. And so some of the reasons why God allows things to happen in people's lives is uh, to show them again his power and his love and that he wants to save them from their sins. But for the believer, God's motive is always, always to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. As it says in verse uh, 29 of Romans 8, uh, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, his son. Uh, to know that for those, um, let, let me back up just a minute. Romans 8, 28, uh, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, God desires to purify us. He desires to remove the dross. He desires to, at times, he prunes back areas in our lives because he wants us to produce more fruit, to learn the importance of abiding in him, that without him, we can do nothing. Psalm 118 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy, because his mercy endureth forever. We can always trust God and his motives, and they are always good. God is only good, and God is always good. And may God help us not to believe the lie that the devil has for us, that God's holding out on us, uh, that God is, is vindictive and that God is, is, is hateful and revengeful towards us. Let's trust in the truth that God is is good. God is too good to do evil. God is too wise to do wrong. And God many times is too deep for us to understand his ways, but yet we can still trust in him. When you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. So tonight we've seen something that God cannot do. He cannot lie. And because of the truth that God cannot lie, we can hold on to his promises. We can trust his motives. And then thirdly, tonight and we'll be done, we can rest in the truth of God. We can rest. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be driven with anxiety in our lives. Why? Because we can trust in the truth of God. Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, we can trust the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly thir thir perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That means the creation account of Genesis chapter 1, we can trust and we don't have to be fearful of some new scientific discovery comes out that's dating um, the earth to be greater than just six, 7,000 years old, but millions of years old. And, and thus we had the gap theory that was promoted even by many Christians because they were fearful. No, we can trust in the truth of God's word and we can believe in a literal six day creation that God created all in six days. When it comes to the Red Sea miracle and the Israelites crossing over the Red Sea on dry ground, and then when the Egyptians tried and, and the waters came back and they were destroyed, we can believe in that miracle. Uh, when it says in Daniel chapter number two about, uh, Daniel chapter three about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children, that they were cast in the fiery furnace, the very guards that cast them in were killed. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were unharmed. They didn't even have a smoke, a, a trace of smoke on them. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, he saw four, the fourth being like the son of God. And he, they came forth. That was a true story because it's in God's word. Daniel in the lion's den, the fact that they threw Daniel into the lion's den, but yet God protected him and kept the mouth shut. Uh, Jonah in the whale or the great fish. We can trust that account because God has given us it in his word and the Bible is true. The fact that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead is the truth that is contained within the scriptures and we read that. And so a great, wonderful blessing for us is that we can rest in the truth. So many times we have faith in God, but we're so unsettled, we're so nervous we look and we see 
you know, it seems to be a, a resurgence of COVID with new variants. And all of a sudden, it kind of like things are getting back to normal. And now it seems like new restrictions and new guidelines are coming in. We can still rest in the truth that God will never leave us nor forsake us. We can rest in the truth that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We can trust in the truth that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God to give it to all men liberally and it not, and that God will give us wisdom in our homes, in our, in our own lives, in our church, in our congregation, and even our country and our world in knowing how to deal with crises, knowing how to deal with difficulties. We can rest in the truth of God, know that we are eternally secure. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. You can't work yourself to heaven. There's no universal heaven. There's only heaven and hell. As Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. By way of review, what can God not do? He cannot lie. There's three wonderful truths for us in this message. First of all, because God cannot lie, we can hold on to his promises. I hope that today God gave you a wonderful promise as he spent time reading his word. Secondly, not only do we hold on to God's promises, but also um, we see the fact that we can rest in the truth of God as well. We hold on to his promises. We trust God's motives that he's going to do what's best for us. And then we can rest in the truth of God. We do not have to be fearful. It's a wonderful blessing to know that God has never lied and he never will lie. And, and how many false cults are out there lying, saying that this is the way to heaven, this is the way to blessedness. You know, there is no God, the atheist says. That's a lie. As it says in the scriptures, the fool hath said, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Wonderful to know that we can hold on to his promises because God does not lie that we can trust God's motives, that he's going to work things out for our good, for his glory, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, and that we can rest in the truth that there's only one way to heaven, that there's only one way to live the Christian life, not in self-confidence, not in pridefulness, not by depending upon others, but by depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close our service in prayer. Father, I thank you for the time in this service. We thank you for this first part of learning what you cannot do. We're so thankful that you are the truth, that you are eternal, and that you do not lie. Uh, God, I pray that we would find a promise to hold on to. Father, would you help us to trust the motives of what you're trying to accomplish in our lives? And God, may we just simply rest in your truth as you speak to our hearts and our lives. We ask that you continue to be with our church family. We think specifically of our college students. We think of Kati and Kaysen and Kylie as they prepare for their semester to start. We pray that you give them um, just your peace and your help. Uh, Kati, as she has her senior year of nursing, and we thank you for your faithfulness and all the promises that you have proven on behalf of her in case that as he starts his junior year, uh, help both of them as they transition, even with work responsibilities and, and classes. And then for Kylie, as she starts her first, um, first year at college, I pray that you'd help her in the transition and certainly uh, help dad and mom as well. Uh, be with our church, watch over and protect. We look forward to great services next Sunday with evangelist Glenn Stevenson and how you're going to work in hearts and lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great day. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, uh, last Wednesday night on the 25th of August, uh, we took a look at the first thing of what God could not do. And from Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 13 through 20, uh, we're so thankful that our God does not lie. And because God does not lie, uh, that brought three truths for us. First of all, that we can hold on to God's promises, uh, knowing that he is faithful and that he will keep his promises. Uh, secondly, we talked about how, how it is that we can trust God's motives, 
and that the things that God brings into our lives, the things that God allows into our lives, will always be for his glory and for our best to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Then we also talked about the importance of us resting in the truth, uh, the truth of salvation, the truth that God has for us in our daily lives. And so tonight we're going to continue in the series of what God cannot do with the second part. And and we're going to look at two specific things that God cannot do in our message tonight. Uh, the first one is this, and I'm so thankful for this. Not only does God not lie, but God cannot sin. God cannot sin. And we find ourselves in James chapter 1 and verses 13 through 16. We're here. The Bible says these words, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err or err, my beloved brethren. I came across this illustration. Um, There was a modern jet on the runway, and it certainly was a thing of beauty. It was equipped with the latest technology and weaponry. Uh, It was a jet that could fly at supersonic speeds and quickly race to great heights. If there was an enemy plane in the vicinity, this um, plane or this jet could destroy it from miles away without the other pilot even knowing that they were there. Uh, There was an Air Force pilot that climbed into the cockpit and took off, leaving the earth far behind as he soared into the clouds. Although no one was looking, the pilot straightened himself in his seat. He was certainly proud of the jet and his ability to qualify to fly such a sophisticated mode of transportation. After he reached a a normal cruising altitude, the pilot began to hear a a different strange noise. He took off his helmet and he recognized the noise. It sounded like something was gnawing on rubber or plastic. And so he began to look around the cockpit and as he looked down the instrument, instrument panel, he noticed that there was a rat in there and the rat was chewing on one of the main power sources uh, that the wires that ran to the, the instrument panel. Uh, he tried to reach it, tried to get it away, but he could not. And so he had to decide what he would do before uh, the rat would chew through and he'd lose controls and crash the plane, um, lose control and crash the plane immediately. You know, many times we find ourselves in life like that pilot in the cockpit Uh, with a a rat, and the rat that's chewing through our main power supply is the sin. And and, and it seems like uh, sin is trying to destroy us, and no matter how uh, many advances in technology that we get, no matter how much um, uh, advances in medical equipment, in in everything, while technology does uh, try to make our lives easier and better, there are still uh, rats and the rat of sin that desires to destroy our lives. Uh, Certainly we see this in the area of temptations. And how you and I respond to temptation will determine whether or not we live the life that God intends to us or whether or not we will crash and burn. I'll tell you this, probably the worst thing that a person can do, that a believer can do, is blame God for the temptation. And and that certainly does happen at times. Uh, First of all, when it comes to our message tonight, God cannot sin, I'd like for us, first of all, to see an accusation. An accusation. Look again at verse number 13 where it says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. To think that there are those who actually believe that the source of the temptation, of the sin desire that is coming to their hearts and their lives is from God. Uh, Some take a fatalistic approach, and they believe that since God is sovereign and nothing is out of his control, that he must be the originator of sin. It kind of goes along the lines of the Calvinistic thinking of God and his sovereignty, uh, that God controls who will be saved and who will not be saved. But, you know, Calvinism, this fatalistic approach to Uh, the origin of sin, where it came from, that God created it, it really does take one key element out of it. Yes, God is sovereign, but God did create man with a free will. And we understand that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve chose of their own, or Adam chose of his own free will. Eve was deceived, but Adam chose his own free will to sin. And so it is today that when an individual understands their 
that, that they are a sinner, that they cannot say themselves that there's consequences for sin and that Christ died on the cross for the sins, was buried and rose again. And if they choose their own free will to trust Christ, they can be saved. And so God made Adam and Eve in perfection, but he also gave them a free will. And with their free will, Adam chose to sin. And so mankind can choose his free will to be saved. So the accusation, we cannot say that we're tempted, we're being tempted of God. So God did not or originate sin, and some take a creationist approach, and that is, well, you know what? The reason why I am the way that I am, the reason why I have a short fuse, uh, the reason why I am an alcoholic, the reason why I am this, the reason why I am that, the reason why I always worry is because uh, my my parents did this, and and their parents, and it's kind of, and the Bible does teach about generational sins, but we cannot say, you know, the reason why um, I am a man and I, I'm i attracted to men, we cannot say, and I'm saying this by way of an illustration, we cannot say that's just the way I am, that's just the way I was made, because God does not create sin. So the accusation that we cannot say that when we are tempted, we are tempted of God. God did not originate sin. God did not create us. While we may, um, we may be prone to several sins, God made man in perfection, and man chose to sin. So we can't blame our weaknesses upon God. So first of all, the accusation, we cannot say that when we're tempted, we're tempted of God. Uh, the observation is found in verse 13. Again, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. First of all, this verse says that God cannot be tempted by its very nature, temptation implies that one is drawn to desire something that he lacks. Now think about this. Does God lack anything? You know, in our lives, we lack position. And many times that causes people to sin to get a greater position. We may lack in power. And so that would cause us to be enticed to sin, to get power, or maybe even in possessions. But the fact is, is that God lacks nothing. God is eternal. He's always been. He's self-sufficient. When it comes to position, he does not lack. He's the almighty God. He's a ruler of heaven and earth. He's a king of kings and the Lord of lords. When it comes to lacking in power, all power is given to him in heaven and earth. He's the one who created all. When it comes to lacking in positions, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns the cattle, as we sing the song, on a thousand hills. And so the first of all, the observation from verse 13 is that God cannot be tempted with evil. And then secondly, God cannot tempt us to evil. God cannot tempt us to evil. Now, God does test us for good. He does test us for good. If you look at verse number 12, it says, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Back in Genesis, I believe it is um, chapter 19, uh, it's a passage where it says that God uh, tempted Abraham. Uh, well, he tested him. Uh, it, it, it's, as, it's, as, it's as if uh, God is testing us uh, to see, and he tested Abraham to see where his love was, if he loved God more than anyone else. So God cannot tempt us to evil, but he does test us. Uh, God does, uh, again, in verse 13, it says, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now God does test, God does try uh, to help us grow, uh, to help us um, in our strength and our walk, with the Lord. So God cannot tempt us to evil. Just as a loving parent um, pushes, encourages a child uh, to a baby to walk, a toddler to walk, um, but they're there and they're helping along the ways that they wouldn't uh, prod a toddler to walk out in front of a street or to walk off of a pier. I um, mean, so it is God does not tempt us to evil. So the accusation, we cannot say when we're tempted, we're tempted of God. God's not the origin of sin. He's not the creator of sin. And then the observation is God, God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he tempt us to evil. Well, the evaluation, where exactly does sin start from? Verse 14 says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his grandpa's lust 
or of his mother's lust, or of his um, neighbor's lust, or of his brother's lust. No. When he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You know, we should not be surprised that sin begins in our own hearts, in our own lives. When we are drawn away of our own lust, there's a story told of, of a young priest that joined an older priest in a confessional booth. And uh, one day, when the day was done, the older priest looked at the younger man and he just kind of gave him advice. He said, my boy, when a person finishes with confession, you have to learn to say something other than, wow. And, you know, that that's just an illustration because we don't believe that we confess our sins to, to priests in order to get God. We go directly to God. But, you know, God never goes, wow. Now, now we can go, wow, at, at some of the choices and of the sins that we become involved with, but sin starts in our own hearts. It's important for us, as the prophet Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We cannot blame God. We cannot blame, blame the devil. There was a, um, a, a spoof on, on a late night show years ago when I was in high school, and uh, they had this uh, spoof, and uh, this person would continuously uh, sin, and then they would give their explanation, the devil made me do it. And, and that was their reason for everything that they did wrong. The devil made me do it. Well, the devil can tempt us, but he doesn't make us to sin. We can't blame our parents for our sin. We can't blame our friends or our environment or our genetics. We have to put the blame directly upon ourselves, upon our own sinful hearts, because we have choices. Uh, notice it says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Uh, the word drawn away has the idea of an external allurement. Um, you get the picture of a wild animal being baited towards a trap with, with some type of food, with some type of meat, and that, that smell is what draws them. But then the word enticed um, has the idea of more of, of um, a person that's fishing, and casting their bait near the fish, trying to entice, trying to allure that that fish to take uh, that bite and to grab hold of that unseen hook. And, and, and so the temptation, when temptation comes, that's not what, where the sin comes. But when we are tempted, we are drawn away of our own lives and enticed. And with, then when... Um, verse 14, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed that when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So the sin happens. Uh, we have our own sinful lust, our own sinful heart. And when that is enticed, when we're drawn away and we grab hold of it, that's when sin conceives. So even though we have a sinful heart and the temptation may come, if we don't grab hold of it, if we don't dwell upon that thought, which will then lead to a deed, and by the way, the end of sin is death. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Yes, there's a sinful desire that's within my, there's a desire within my heart, and, and I have a sinful heart. And, and so if I give in to that sinful desire and that lust conceives, that's when sin happens, and it brings forth death. Uh, we should not be, as it says in verse 16, do not err or do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. We need to remember that God cannot sin. Uh, he's not the creator of it. Uh, we have a sin nature within ourselves, and the ending point of sin is death. Uh, I, I'd like to close uh, this first point of God cannot sin with concluding with the opening illustration where the pilot was up in the plane, high altitude, could not um, could not land, um, but the rat was there. He's trying to decide what exactly to do. And so what he decided to do was he decided to put on his oxygen and climb to an altitude to where uh, he knew that that rat could not survive. And so he put on his oxygen and he began to climb as quickly as he could. And uh, eventually... Uh, and fortunately, before the rat was able to chew too too much through that wire, um, the rat was able to 
was um, knocked unconscious and eventually died because of the lack of oxygen at the altitude. And, you know, when it comes to our sin natures, and again, the, the point of the message for us tonight is that God cannot sin, and we're thankful for that. And that's such a blessing and encouragement to us. But it's important for us to realize that our sinful nature, yes, we have it within us, but we also have the Spirit of God. And so daily we choose to yield, whether to the Spirit or to the flesh. We choose to feed either the Spirit or the flesh. And so it may be that, uh, yes, God cannot sin, and, and we are his children, and we have been commanded to be holy as he is holy in all manner of conversation. Wow, that's, that's quite a challenge for us because we still have that sinful nature, but let's stop feeding it. Let's stop giving in to our sinful appetite and, and desires. And, and, and it may just be a random thought that just comes into our mind when you're bringing that thought into captivity to obedience and to the knowledge and the excellency of Jesus Christ and not dwell upon, not go down the progression of that sinful thought. And so what we need to do is we need to be in the Word of God, meditate upon its screw, truths, and apply those truths to our lives. And as we do that, we will deprive our sinful flesh, its power, its appetite, its cravings because of the Word of God and because of the Spirit of God. So we've seen, first of all, God does not lie. That was last week's message tonight. We've seen that God does not or God cannot sin. But also I'd like to share with you a third point tonight, and that is that God cannot change. God cannot change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 uh, says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. I came across this quote, The only thing you can count on is that you can't count on anything. Well, that's true for us as human beings, but not for God, because while everything around us and everything in us may change, God does not. A few thoughts about God does not change. First of all, God does not change in his morals. God does not change in his morals. Verse 17 of James 1 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, cometh down from the Father lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, our society certainly has changed in its morality. Years ago, we had TV shows like Andy Griffith and Fathers Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver. And, and now we have all different other types of television shows where um, morality is not taught, but wickedness is openly promoted and accepted and viewed as acceptable. Um, you know, years ago, in the, our public school system, uh, children were sent to the office for chewing gum, or maybe if they were really rambunctious, they um, spit a spit wad at someone. But now students are sent to the office um, for fornication, for drugs, distributing drugs, and, and all other things. So certainly society has changed. Some think that, that God over the years has changed. They look at um, God being different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, I do understand that God does deal differently in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the law pointing mankind to a Savior in Jesus Christ. The New Testament is not law, but it's grace. Uh, but God has still been the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and they'll say, well, God was so violent and he was so... A judge, he was so condemning of sin in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. Well, you look in Acts and you see that Ananias and Sapphira died, and because they died, they both were struck dead. Uh, some may say, well, God wasn't merciful in the Old Testament. He certainly was merciful in the Old Testament when you consider Rahab and God's mercy in saving her and her household. When you consider Ruth and Naaman and Nineveh and Nebuchadnezzar and the nation of Israel, you see, God does not change his morality. And although we may like to look in the Old Testament, New Testament, see, see God has changed. He has not. Uh, we can't look at, at the principles and the commands and the laws of God's word and say that, well, that was for back then and this is for today. Um, when it comes to sin, God still hates sin. But when it comes to the sinner, 
I'm so thankful that God still loves a sinner. There's a, not a sinner that God cannot save. So God does not change in his morals. Secondly, God does not change in his might. The little kids sing that song, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. As we age physically, we realize that there are limitations to what we may have been able to do in our might and our strength, but now we are no longer able to. Many times when when big, bad events, uh, you know, this uh, coming September 11th, uh, just 10, 10 days away from when this message will be um, uh, shown for our church service, will be the 20th year of 9-11 when the terrorists flew into the Twin Towers and and into the Pentagon. And, and we think about those terrible events and, and people could ask, you know, why, why would God allow that to happen? Is he not mighty that he could have stopped that? Or we look at disasters and we're starting to enter into hurricane season for the United States, specifically for the East Coast and down in the South. And we think, couldn't God stop all that? Is he no longer mighty? Is there something that God cannot do? Where is God when all these difficult things happen in our lives? You know, the nation of Israel had been carried off into captivity, and Isaiah reminded them of several truths about God that they need to be reminded of. First of all, in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 and 29, he says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. I'm so thankful that God is still mighty. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse number one says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. Today we may struggle, but there is no doubt of God's power, whether it is to heal the sick or to provide for our needs, the power to protect from evil, the power to save the lost. Our God does not change in his might. Thirdly, God does not change in his method, in his method. Well, how did people get saved in the Old Testament? Wasn't by works? No. If you would turn with me to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and and here we see um, from specifically two examples, Abraham, and also uh, we see from King David how they were saved. Romans chapter 4 and beginning in verse 1, we see that uh, the way of faith was the way that Abraham was saved. Romans chapter 4, verse 1, What shall we say then, Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified or saved by works, he hath whereof to glory, but now bef- not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted to righteousness. So Old Testament believers were saved the same way that you and I are today, and that is by faith. Now they look forward to the Messiah coming and dying for their sins. We look back to what Christ has done. It was also the way that David was saved, verses 6 through 8. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And again, it's not by works, but it's by faith. And so God does not change in his method of being saved. And, and we may even think as things in our world are changing so much that we've got to change in order to reach the world. We've got to water down the gospel message. We've got to make it simpler so that way they can understand. Um, the power is not in our reason or our ability. The power is in the gospel of Christ. As Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We understand that, yes, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God will never change in his way of salvation. We don't have to fear because of changing times. God does not change in his morals. God does not change in his methods. Number four, God does not change in his mercy. 
Again, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know, the nation of Israel at this time, they doubted his love. They despised his name. They defiled his covenant and they disobeyed his word. But God said, you know what? I've got a covenant with you and I will not change. That covenant will not change. For I am the Lord, I change not. For ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God was telling them that he would never forsake them. And aren't you thankful that God's mercy does not change in your life and my life? As it says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Then verse 8, Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, in part one, we saw that God cannot lie, and we're thankful for that. We can trust his promises uh, we can we can realize that his motives are best for us, and we can rest in his truth. Then today we've seen that God cannot sin. Al- although some may say that God is the originator of sin, he was not, for he cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But it's our own sinful nature that uh, when our lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished, bringeth forth death. And so the important thing for us is, is to be in God's Word and to be meditating upon the truths of God's Word, um, to walk in the Spirit, so that way our flesh, our sinful nature, is not um, activated. It doesn't have the opportunity to act upon the lustful thoughts. And then we're so thankful that God does not change. And and I don't know where you're at um, when you're listening to this message and what struggles that you may be even facing uh, about God. Um, it may be that y- you believe, yeah, God was mighty in the past, but he's not mighty today because of everything that's happened in my lives. Would you just put your, would you just talk to the Lord and ask him to help you with your faith and trust and the might of God? And, and that God will not change in his might and in his power. And the God of the Bible that we see and all the wonderful, mighty things he's done is still all powerful today. It may be a sin that you're struggling with. You haven't been able to get victory over it. God can help you overcome that sin. It may be the fact that you don't know that God could save you from your sins. You're not a believer, but God can. He loves you. He sent his son to die upon the cross for your sins. We're so thankful that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. While things are so changing in our world today, God does not change. If you're a believer, you don't have to worry. God's in charge. He's not going to change. If you're not a believer, then I would say you need to hurry because God does not change. There's only one way of salvation. And yes, he is merciful, but there is there is an extent to his mercy to where he says, okay, I'm going to let you go in that direction. Uh, just as he was merciful to Pharaoh to some extent, and then he just allowed Pharaoh to continue to go in the hardness of his heart. Let's close for prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had to sing some songs and also to worship you. I pray that our hearts will be encouraged, that you cannot sin, and that you cannot change. And Father, we may be struggling with sin in our hearts and our lives, and may we understand um, that it's the drawing away and the enticing, and that to have a wrong thought is not sinful, but it's what we do if we allow that uh, to um, conceive in our mind and continue to go down that thought, um, that pathway. And so, Father, would would we be thankful that you do not change and uh, help us, Father, uh, to trust you with our todays and our tomorrows. Uh, We look forward to what you're going to continue to do in each of our hearts and lives. We ask your blessing as we take these truths and apply them to our hearts and lives, we pray in Christ's name. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. Now, one of the things uh, that folks that know me pretty well know that I don't do well when I see blood. Um, if it's my blood, I guess it's okay, but uh, for some re- unless it's being drawn from my arm, um, I could still remember back to when I was working in high school as an assistant janitor, and we were 
uh, cleaning out this um, this alcove in the gymnasium, and we were doing some demolition, which certainly every guy loves to do demolition, especially get paid for it. And the head janitor um, was uh, swinging a hammer, trying to uh, remove a, a two by four, and uh, so it wasn't going as he was swinging like this. So he decided uh, to take the hammer and to swing upward. Well, lo and behold, he wasn't the most coordinated janitor, and he missed the two by four, and that hammer came and hit him right in the middle of his forehead. And uh, he turned around, his name was Dave, he turned around, and when I saw it, I mean, there was just blood everywhere. And I thought for certain that he had killed himself. And so I, I very quickly ran out of the gymnasium and ran down to the office to tell the office personnel, hey, um, you know, Dave is hurt really bad. Um, when Robin at one time, I think it was when she was pregnant with Case and uh, she's getting some blood drawn for some tests and, and here I am watching and I'm just getting queasy and I'm just kind of sliding down the wall. I, I, I don't do well at the sight of blood, especially my own blood when it's being drawn. Uh, there may be some things that you can't stand to look upon. Um, you know, I'm thankful that it's been a long time since I've had to really look upon a dirty diaper and clean um, a baby from a dirty diaper. Uh, certainly not something that is is enjoyable, but certainly something that parents do out of love. Well, tonight we're going to take a look at uh, the th- the fourth and fifth thing in our series of God, what God cannot do, and we're going to look at at we've looked at God cannot lie. Uh, we looked at the truth that God cannot tempt us to sin, nor can God sin. And then God does not change. And tonight we're going to look at two other truths. And the first one is this, that God cannot look upon sin. God cannot look upon sin. Habakkuk chapter number one, excuse me, Habakkuk chapter one in verse 13. Uh, here, let me make sure I'm on the right page here. Habakkuk 1, 13, uh, the Bible says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity, Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and hold thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he? Again, that first part, thou art of pure eyes, and behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. Um, God cannot look upon sin. It's not because of a weakness of God, but it's because of his holiness. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had a vision of the thrice holy God, where the seraphim are flying about, the throne room of God crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And everything that God does um, is influenced by his holiness. And because God is holy, he cannot look upon sin. Well, how does God's holiness affect us? Well, first of all, God's holiness affects us in that it causes us to be separated from him. God's holiness causes us to be separated from him. Romans 3.10 as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, when God created Adam and Eve before the fall, they were perfect. They were without sin. They could have fellowship. But after the fall, there was separation between God and Adam and Eve because of sin. Our sin separates us from God. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from, from you that he will not hear you. And so our sins have separated us from God. Well, how many sins does it take for us to separate from God? It's just one. James says that if I, if I offend in one point, if I transgress the law in one point, I'm guilty all, of all. Let me ask you, if you went home and, and your, your car was in your garage and uh, you, you opened the garage door and right as you walked in the garage door, you noticed that there was a skunk in your garage. Um, how many skunks would it take you to stay out of that garage? For me, it would just be one. It wouldn't be five, it wouldn't be a hundred, it wouldn't be a, a million. It'd just be one skunk would be enough to keep me out. And so it is, one sin is enough to separate us from God. Why? Because God is holy. So God's holiness causes there to be a separation, but God's holiness also demands that there be a justification or a declaring righteous, a declaring of perfection. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified or declared righteous 
by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God cannot even look upon sin, so how can I ever be right with God? The only way for you and I to be right with God is through justification. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross, and as he was on the cross, God the Father took all the sins of all mankind, our punishment, our penalty, our death, our eternal damnation, hell, put it upon his son, Jesus Christ. He took our place. He took our penalty. And as he did that, we then um, can have forgiveness of sins. And Christ, while on the cross during that three hours of darkness, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For he hath made him to be sin for us. That's what Christ did on the cross that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As it says in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save me from my sins, then I am declared righteous. I have the righteousness of Christ placed upon my account. So the holiness of God, how does that affect us? It causes a separation, but that separation can only be bridged. It can only be grabbed, um, 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 it can only be done away with, the separation can only be done away with through justification for us to be declared righteous. Well, if sin, because God's holiness, sin causes me to separate from God, because of my faith and trust in Christ, it causes me to be justified. And, and now God looks at me and he sees the righteous of son, Jesus Christ. How then should I live? How should the holiness of God affect me? First Peter chapter one says, be holy as I am holy in all manner of conversation. So because of God's holiness, there's a separation because of sin, but because of Christ's death upon the cross, there is justification available to all who believe upon him. And then there is a process of sanctification where we choose to live for the Lord, where we choose to be holy. If God drew us out of muddy clay, he doesn't want us to go mallow, or wallowing back in the mud again. James 1, 27, pure religion before and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. How do we keep ourselves unspotted from the world? Well, God is holy. He cannot look upon sin, and that is a key for us. Why should we look upon sin? Uh, many times uh, the sin that affects our hearts as believers comes through the eye gate. Proverbs, um, Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Proverbs 4, 25, let thine eyes look right on, let thine eyelids look straight before thee. God cannot look upon sin. And so you and I as believers, we need to keep our heart with all diligence for out of the issues life. We need to ponder the path of our feet. Let our eyes look straight on, our eyelids look straight before us. I understand that in the for forests of Northern Europe and Asia, there lives, lives a little animal called the ermine, and it's um, known for its snow white fur in the winter time. And it, is, it instinctively protects its white coat against anything that would defile it, anything that would soil it. Uh, the fur hunters took advantage of this unusual trait of the ermine, where they didn't, uh, they didn't set a, a snare to catch it. But what they do is they find the ermine's home, and they would put grime all around the entrance of it. Their dogs would chase the ermine, and the ermine would not go through that hole. It would not defile its coat, and thus it would be captured. And certainly we do, uh, we should learn a lesson even from this um, ermine that we would um, set a watch before our eyes and before our lips and before our ears, uh, that we would strive uh, through Christ's strength and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the yielding of the Holy Spirit, to be holy as he is holy. God's holiness, yes, there was a separation because of sin, but there can be justification, be made righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And once we come to that place, we should desire to daily be sanctified, set apart from that which is sinful. And then God's holiness also reminds us that one day there will be a glorification. If we want to understand what heaven is like, we remember that God cannot look upon sin. Therefore, heaven will be totally without sin. In Revelation, it tells us that there will be nothing that worketh abomination. There will be no sin that enters into heaven. Uh, heaven is a pure place, uh, pure gold, pure fruit, pur pure water, pure air. We think about all the things in this world that are defiling. 
I mean, it's hard to go out in public, whether it's in the supermarket or whether it's in the mall or what, wherever it is, and and not be flooded and bombarded with with um, sinfulness through our eye gate. But there will be nothing that worketh an abomination in heaven. Not only will the place itself be pure, but the people will be pure. Uh, we will have been de- already delivered from the penalty of sin because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Not only are we today being delivered from the power of sin, we don't have to let sin therefore reign in our bodies, but we can yield our members as servants to righteousness and not unto righteousness. But on that day when we're in heaven, we'll be delivered from the presence of sin and sin will be delivered from us. No more sin nature, no more tug of war in our hearts, no more temptation, no more guilty conscience. It's almost like the skunk who's a scent has been removed. We'll be face to face. So first of all, tonight, we've seen another thing that God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot tempt us to sin. Uh, God cannot change. Tonight, we've seen um, that uh, that God um, cannot look upon sin. Why? Because God is holy. And then uh, lastly, in, our, in this three-part series, uh, we're going to see that God cannot fail. God cannot fail. Uh, Zephaniah 3 and verse 5 says this, The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doeth, doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Not only can God cannot lie, he cannot tempt anyone or be tempted to sin, he cannot change, he cannot look upon sin, but God cannot fail. Have you ever failed? I, I certainly have. Have you ever been depending upon something? Uh, maybe, ladies, you're getting ready in the morning, you use a blow dryer, and the blow dryer failed, or the curling iron failed, or you were working on a project and the um, the drill failed, or whatever tool you were using failed. It is impossible for God to fail. He's omniscient. He knows all. He knows everything before it happens. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere in his presence at all times. There's no hiding or surprising God. And he's omnipotent. He's more powerful than anything. Can you imagine um, being a coach of a team um, full of of team members with God's attributes? Uh, What about fighting a war or playing a game against someone with those attributes? God cannot fail. And you know, in our life, uh, we are on a team. Uh, we are a part of a local assembly here at Open Door Baptist Church. And and aren't you thankful that God has promised uh, that upon this rock, the confession of Peter, that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. To know that greater is he than that is in you than he that is in the world. To know that we can thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so God cannot fail. And just looking at a few areas that God cannot fail. First of all, God's wonders cannot fail. Ecclesiastes 3.14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. You know, when when it comes to God's wonders or his miracles, they cannot fail. Um, Whenever God heals someone, they are healed. You think about times in the scriptures, Naaman. Naaman was healed of his leprosy. Bartimaeus was healed of his blindness. Jairus' daughter and Lazarus were both risen uh, from the dead. Whenever God heals someone, they are healed. He never fails in his healing, in his healing. Whenever God sends a miracle, it is a miracle, and he never fails in that. Uh, Moses didn't have to wonder about the rod, if it had turned into a snake, or if stretched out over the Nile River, if it turned to blood, for he knew that God had promised it. Elijah didn't have to wonder if God would call down fire from heaven to his prayer, because God is faithful. He does not fail. Uh, Jesus didn't have to wonder if the fig tree would be cursed when he came back the next day. And the resurrection, we don't have to wonder if Christ did not rise from the dead. Why? Because God never fails. Whenever God saves a person, they are saved. You know, there's physical salvation. We see Noah and those in the ark. We see Daniel from the lion's den. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we see over and over again in scriptures where God physically saved a person. But when God spiritually saves a person from their sin, there is no need to worry. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. God's wonders cannot fail. Um, the, the wonders that he's done in the past and the wonders that he'll also do in the future. Not only do we see that God's wonders cannot fail, but God's word cannot fail. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall accomplish that which, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You know, we can look at the Bible and we can see that God's word in the past has not failed. Uh, One of the greatest proofs of the scripture, I believe, is fulfilled prophecy. Whether it's the destruction of Babylon or the destruction of Israel, the return of his Israel, we see the the prophecies about the Messiah that are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ from his birthplace to his birthday to his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, when it comes to um, prophecies in the scripture, his word does not fail. The past, you know, his word in the present does not fail either. Uh, he says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. James 1, 5, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace of God that passeth all understanding to know that he gives me joy unspeakable and full of glory. He gives me my daily bread and give us this day our daily bread. He gives me to the, the ability to love my enemies, to do good to those who despitefully use me. You know, God's word in the past has not failed. We see it fulfilled prophecy. And God's word in the present, whatever test, whatever temptation, whatever trial you're going through, God's word will not, be, will not fail. So don't depend upon yourself. Don't rely upon yourself. God's word cannot fail. And certainly his word about the future will not fail. You know, he's promised to come back. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to know that he's promised to return to, to know that we will all one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive those things that are done in our body, whether they be good or they be bad. And God will give us rewards for our service and our faithful service to him. You know, God cannot fail. Uh, his works, what he's done, and his word. So in this three-part series, we've seen that God cannot lie. We can trust him. We can trust his plan, his motives for our lives. Uh, We've also seen that God cannot change. He is forever the same. Uh, We've also seen that God uh, does not look upon sin. He does not tempt us to sin, or is he tempted with sin? And then lastly, um, God, um, God, God cannot fail, and we're so thankful or that he never fails. You know, there was a boy that carried his stuffed gorilla everywhere he went and he called it Rilla. And eventually Rilla fell apart. All the stuffing came out. And so the little boy said, mommy, Rilla's broken, fix it, mommy. And when she reached down to take it, he wouldn't let it go. And so a tug of war ensued and she says, I can fix it, but you gotta let it go. I can't fix it unless you let go. Many times you and our, I are like that in our lives is, is we've got something that needs to be fixed. We've got a problem. We've got a difficulty, but we're not willing to let it go. Will we be willing to trust in a God 
who will keep his word, who has proven his works in the past and the present and the future. God cannot fail. God cannot lie. God cannot tempt us to sin, nor is he tempted by sin. God cannot change, and he cannot look upon sin. What a great and mighty God we serve. Let's close this service in prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for these truths that we've looked at, and I pray that there would be something that would be a blessing and encouragement to us. We're thankful that we can trust a God um, who is holy, and who desires and who enables us to be holy uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can trust in a God who never fails. Would you minister your word by your spirit in each of our hearts and lives? We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.